Tales from the Wild. Stories from the Heart. A journey into the mind and soul of fired up business professionals where they share their vision for the future. And hear from a different non profit organization every month as they create awareness of their goals and their needs. Dive into a world of untamed passion as we join our host, Shireen Buerta, for this month's episode of Friends from Wild Places. Alright, good day professionals, Shireen here. I'm your virtual bookkeeper and QuickBooks advisor. Recording your loans is not just adding your notes payable to the books to track. You also need to show how much of your balance is the current portion. Current portion meaning the next 12 months. The reason you want to show this on your balance sheet is for the people who use your financial statements and want to see how much you owe and if you'll have the capability to service that debt within the next 12 months. If you haven't been doing this and are looking to keep your credit score clean, make me your bookkeeper today and allow me to stay on top of your books so you don't have to. If you want to know more about Shireen's bookkeeping services, go check me out at www.shireensbookkeeping.com and allow me to keep your books clean. All right, welcome back. You are listening to Friends from Wild Places and I am your host, Shireen Boerta. So today I want to get straight into it and introduce my co-host of the episode, this is Matt Wadlington. He is owner of Avila and Wadlington Contractors, Inc. in California, United States. Welcome, Matt. It's so good to have you on live with me. I've um, been wanting you to join me for a while now. So thanks for making time in your busy day for my podcast. So, Oh, no worries. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. So... Matt, I want to get into a little bit of a, as you would call it, a hot topic. What are your thoughts about what happened in Memphis with Tari Nichols? Yeah, I mean, that's a long, a long heated answer. I mean, I think it's absolutely disgusting. I think the level of police brutality, just racism is just so alive and out there and it brings up a lot of emotions it's unacceptable it's it really stirs up a lot in me because um being someone of, of mixed race who's experienced nothing on that level but definitely some profiling from police uh, growing up in the inner city it's something that needs to be really addressed before things just boil over it's, it's a hard thing to kind of put one answer on it, but it's just terrible in every way. No, I get it. I was going to ask you a question, but before I, I go further with this topic, so for the listeners, if you are not aware of what's happening or what happened in Memphis, Texas, there was a young man, Tyree Nichols, who was pulled up by a couple of police officers for a normal traffic stop. And long story short, I don't know the full details of how it transpired, um, but there was a disagreement and there was five black members of the police force that beat up this gentleman, Tyree Nichols, who's also a black man, to death. And there is obviously video footage that's been released. You can Google it. You, you'll find it immediately. It's a massive hot topic that's going around on the news. There is a body cam that catches the brutal fight as well as there's a camera on the opposite side of the road that caught the entire thing as well. I have watched the video. It is absolutely heartbreaking and as you say, really disgusting. And I will say my bit now, but I wanted to ask you, one of the things that have come up that they're saying is they think that this is stemmed from white supremacy and racism. Uh, you did mention racism. Do you agree with this? And, and 
why do you think well, this I mean I think I think there's a deeper rooted problem in police departments obviously it's hard to say this is white supremacists because I think four out of the five officers that were involved were were, after, were black as well. Um, I think the police departments just need to look at kind of the mental state of their officers. You know, I understand it's a it's a tough, stressful job, and not to make excuses for them, but you know, if I were a police officer approaching people, you never know what can happen. But still, you're you're in the position to serve and protect, not beat to death, you know? And there was no evidence that the officer's lives were in any type of danger. There's no justification for that amount of brutal force. I just think it goes to looking at the individuals that are involved in the situation and for other black officers to do this to another black person in the community. It says a lot of just where a lot of police officers are mentally. Yeah. So, you know, the thing is for me, they had ample opportunity and amount of time to stop. I mean, this went yeah. on for three or four minutes straight. They, they had more than enough opportunities to stop what they were doing. And from the video, I don't actually, I think there was five black police officers from what I could see, but regardless, all I can say is I was brought up in the generation of uh, you don't see color. So I had multiple black friends and, and that's how I was brought up. Uh, mm -hmm. In this generation, in today's era, that is inappropriate to say, because then you are saying that you don't see their actual beauty of being a black person, an Asian person of, you know, different ethnicities and, oh, my word, sorry. And yes, absolutely, you should acknowledge a beautiful black woman or a handsome Asian man. But regardless of your color, regardless of what you look like, this was wrong in every way, shape, form, point of view, uh, culture, um, it doesn't matter in what direction you come from. This was, this did not have to happen. It really didn't. And it was very sad for me to see uh, this extent. I mean, these things were happening and you could see it on the news, but I mean, this was, this was tragic. I mean, this was, there was no stopping them. There was no stopping them. And the fact that you could hear them commenting at the end when he was down, Tari was down. He wasn't fighting. He was lying on the ground. And you could hear the comments of these police officers amongst each other going, you know, he was high as a kite or, you know, he was so far gone. And, you know, he, he hit me and I was like, you hit me? I'm going to hit you back, son. You know, things like that. And I was just, I was like, oh, wait, hold on. Step back for a moment. What is going on here? Are you not supposed to be police officers? You know? Well, that's what I'm saying. They they really need to start looking into just more analyst of where these police officers are officers are mentally, you know. Right. Obviously they're failing at that. Right. Yeah, it's uh it's a big problem. And you know, these are the incidents that we get to see. I'm sure there's a dozens more daily or weekly that don't get publicized. Right. You know, this is this is a, a rampant problem across America. Yeah. Um, and yeah. they need to they need to do something about it. Mm -hmm. you know? Especially mm -hmm. when you start seeing it being black officers assaulting a black citizen. I don't think even people in the African African American community can wrap their heads around it. Most pe most minorities feel very uncomfortable when dealing with the police. You know, now to even have to feel uncomfortable when you're dealing with an officer that is the same ethnic background as you as you is really sad. No, I agree with you. <clears throat> Look, I won't continue on much more on this topic guys can always go and google and see the whole story online 
Um, but I'm going to end with saying I do not believe that there was any white supremacy or racism involved. I think it was wrong, no matter what you are, no matter who you are, it should never have happened. And as a human being, I think there needs to be change when it comes to that. And also, you know, what you're saying, Matt, I, and this is a whole new thing that we can go on forever about, but me being South African, uh, I, when I get pulled over, I'm, you know, we're the minority. And when I say we, I'm talking about white people here in South Africa. And so a, a large number, percentage of our police force is all black. And when they pull us over, unfortunately, they've got a very well-known name for being corrupt. So I always get very nervous uh, when getting pulled over by our police force. Um, and I've got multiple stories that have happened to me as a single woman that's that has not been very good experience. But anyway, there's definitely space for change. And I only hope and pray that there is some sort of a change that starts today. So let's get into it. How I met Matt is Matt is part of my networking group called High Performance Referrals. Matt has not been there for very long, but he has been there for a good few months. And how long has it been now? I think it's been about seven months, maybe okay. eight. Yeah. That sounds so about been right. yeah, seven months. <laughs> and uh, he's the contractor of our group. So Matt, what has BNI done for you thus far? Uh, a lot of things. It's introduced me to... A lot of people that I, you know, obviously wouldn't have met otherwise, one being yourself uh, in South Africa, don't think our paths would have crossed without B and I. It's really forced me to step out of my comfort zone, which is one of the main reasons that I did it. As you know, we're, you know, on Zoom meetings, asked to give presentations and small kind of talk about ourselves, which is really not my strong suit. So, um, and doing things like this. So I think that was one of the big reasons I wanted to kind of, to try to overcome that kind of phobia that I have. And it's helped a lot. And it's brought me some, some really good business referrals. Okay. The BNI process does work. So it's done um, nothing but positive things for me since I joined. Yeah, I mean, as I said, I our group is HPR, High Performance Referrals. And if you do work in the Bay Area and you run your business there in the Bay Area, California, and you would like to join a networking group, then I encourage you to come and visit ours. I will leave the website where you can go and register yourself just to come as a visitor and see what you think. There's no pressure for you to join. That's totally up to you. But at least you can start uh, visiting different networking groups and find your tribe that suits you and your business. So I want to begin by just sharing a quote with you today. It's integrity is doing the right thing even when no one is watching. And that's by C.S. Lewis. What does it mean to do the right thing? Making decisions that are not based on your own personal needs, that don't expand your popularity or enforce your personal beliefs. It means doing what is best for the greater and common good. So Matt, do you agree with that statement? Yeah, absolutely. I think so, huh? We could all learn to be a little bit better with that, I feel, um, when it comes to integrity. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Matt, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, yeah, well, I was uh, originally, both sides of my family are from Cleveland, Ohio, and they relocated to San Francisco when I was a, just about nine months old. I grew up in San Francisco in the Mission District. I relocated to Marin County, which is just north of San Francisco in 2004. So I've been in Marin County since 04, which was 
a hard transition for me. I thought I'd be in the city forever and my wife had other plans for us, but it's been great. I wouldn't change it for the world. Now we live kind of out in West Marin, which is a little bit out in the, in the country. So it's nice to kind of come home to that after, you know, long kind of busy days and a good chunk of our work is still in San Francisco. So I still get my city fixed and then I'm able to leave, which is nice. But yeah, and then I got into construction right around that time. I had always kind of dabbled in it, you know, summer jobs growing up and then decided to get into it full time, kind of on a whim. It's a long story of how I kind of fell into being a contractor, but yeah, started the business about 15 years ago. And, you know, for anyone that started a business, you know, just slowly kind of built it up to what it is now and things are going really well. And yeah, really, really, truly blessed. To be right. Has it always been this size or did you grow it bigger than what it is now? Yeah. You know, it started off with dreams of conquering the world, right? Like right. we're going to we're going to take this thing to the moon. And, you know, here in the Bay Area, I was fortunate to get in with a good group of, of people and had a really good network of clients. And the company just was growing really fast. And from having just two employees, kind of when I first started, within like four years, we were up to almost 40 employees. I realized pretty quickly that that's not really what I wanted. Yeah, it started to just really wear on my, my health, all the stress. It started triggering some anxiety stuff nice. um, that was really difficult to manage through. I was going through a really hard time with like severe panic attacks. You know, waking up in the middle of the night, thinking I'm having a heart attack, you know, <laughs> having to go to the hospital. And, uh, you know, this was when I was in my mid thirties, my wife, uh, God bless her was just like, you know, this isn't really worth it. So let's start thinking of how we can, you know, start scaling this back to get it to something that's just a little more manageable. And, you know, it's all about quality of life. So right, exactly, exactly. I slowly just started dwindling it down and started focusing more on, you know, my, my health. And, you know, it was, it was interesting that kind of, as I started kind of scaling it back and just relieving some of that stress that the anxiety almost went away, not right away, but it definitely helped. So now we're down to about 12 employees and it's kind of our sweet spot and um, move through all that anxiety stuff. I think it was definitely connected to just the stress of the workload that I was managing and the people and just, it's a, you know, being a contractor is noted as being one of the most, you know, stressful jobs you can have. So yeah, that was, that took a few years to kind of move through that and wrap things up that we were committed to before we could start scaling it back. But yeah, you know, life's a journey, you know, you, <laughs> you have these dreams of what that looks like, um, from seeing it, you know, from the outside. And sometimes once you start living it yourself, you realize that, wow, this isn't, this is a lot different than, than what I thought it would be. So. Would you consider that your biggest challenge that you had owning a business of your own? Yeah, it was just, you know, getting to a point of saying no, you know, and kind of knowing what I wanted and just kind of re reevaluating, you know, what was important to me. And it was killing me and probably would have killed me if I kept on that same route. You know, I've had a handful of contractors around my same age that have had strokes. I've had, you know, stuff like that from the stress. So yeah, I'd say that was one of my biggest challenges was just managing the growth and figuring out, you know, what worked for me and what didn't and 
what worked for my family as well, you know. Um, yeah. During that time, I was pulled away a lot for work. Then dealing with all the health stuff when I was home, it just wasn't, it was, it was a lot of stress for them as well. So, but yeah, you know, it, there's, there's a lot of challenges, but I would say that was, was a big one for sure. Absolutely. What are the, some of the ways that helped you um, manage your, your anxiety? Uh, did you go to the doctor? Were you on some medication yeah. just to assist you? Or? I went to the doctor and of course, you know, their first thing is here, we'll take this, you know, and exactly. um, I forget exactly what it was, but I think I took it once or twice and it was almost worse than the anxiety. I mean, it just kind of zonks you out and kind of just a, a, a zombie. So the main thing that helped me was I started going to talk to a, a therapist in Mill Valley. I come from a very stoic Midwest kind of family where you don't talk about, you kind of buckle down and just deal with it, you know, and yes. you know, that was putting a lot of stress on me mentally. And so my body started to, to fight back and talking to someone about it helped a lot. And during that process of building my business, I kind of lost all the things that I would do for myself. Right. So I used to be very active in sports and fitness and outdoors. And okay. over the, you know, eight year process of building the business, I wasn't doing any of that. Yeah. I was working and then I'd come home and then I'd work. It was just working at home and working at home. And that was it. Mm -hmm. And through the process of trying to battle the anxiety, I just started doing a lot more of that stuff that I stopped doing. I started exercising again through CrossFit. I started mountain biking and fishing again and making a point to go do things with the family. And it helped tremendously. I mean, within a year, my anxiety was almost gone. So just kind of lost myself in, in, in the hustle and the grind of, you know, trying to be what I had always envisioned of what would be of being successful mm -hmm. and you know, started paying the price of chasing my own success and just kind of had a reality check and had to scale it back a little bit. So it was a huge learning experience and really made me appreciate, you know, the things that I have a lot more, you know, so. Absolutely. Yeah. That's awesome, Matt. And thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, if you could tell us what was a lesson you learned that if you got to do it over again, would do it differently? <laughs> um, wow. <laughs> I would have, uh, that's a tough one. I would have just taken it slow, I guess. I was, uh, I would have just taken it slow. I would have taken more time to enjoy things instead of just chasing all the time. You know, life moves fast enough already. And when you're in that mode, it just seemed to move even faster. And, you know, as you get older, you just start appreciating, you know, getting to a point where you can slow life down a little bit. So, yeah, I'd say I, I would slow down. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Stop, stop the smell the roses, is the, I, I'd say, you know. Sure. No, I like that, that because I think one of the biggest um, in the beginning, for me, one of the biggest things is why am I not growing faster? You know, like, hurry up, let's bring on more clients. But then someone also actually said to me, just enjoy the process. There's a yeah. reason why you are where you are and why it's taking the time that it is. And maybe that's exactly what you need. Um, and maybe if you had gotten six clients in one go, you might have become overwhelmed and might have quit before you even started your business. And that made me think, and I thought, well, actually, maybe, yeah, because I am also a person that suffers a lot with anxiety and depression. And I suppose, um, you know, my first few clients that I got, it was spaced out. And I'm kind of grateful for that because it, I could give each client really focused attention that I think if they 
came at the same time, I would have been like trying to juggle them both and give them the best service, personalized service that I could. So you are so right about that. Well, be careful what you wish for, right? That's what they say. So Yeah, exactly. No, I like that. Yeah. So I want to introduce the nonprofit of the episode today before we continue, because I do have a few more questions, but let's allow Kathy to enter the room. Kathy, can you hear us? Hello. Welcome. Everyone that's listening, this is Kathy Cray. She is president and founder of African Orphan Educational Foundation, Inc. in Florida, United States. So it's so good to have you here with us today, Kathy. So thank you for taking the time to join us. And thank you so much for having us. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. So I was just asking a, a few questions to Matt and I will continue doing that now I just wanted to begin the second half with a little bit of a segue into the platform that I use for my podcast and before I even begin I want to just share the reason why I started this podcast was to share stories from other business owners and to bring support for young entrepreneurs all over the world when business owners start out, we have such a fire in our hearts and excitement to start our own businesses. But when things get tough, I want us to know that we are not alone. I feature nonprofits every month to try and make a difference or give a helpline to someone in need. Are you looking for a new marketing channel? Or do you have a message you want to share with the world? Or maybe you just think it'll be fun to have your own talk show. Podcasting is an easy, inexpensive, and fun way to expand your reach online. Just start your own podcast and get a $20 Amazon gift card. Follow the link in the show notes. This lets Buzzsprout know we sent you and help support my show. I can't do it alone, and I do need your help. So there is another way that you can support my show, and that's by subscribing to the podcast on buzzsprout.com. It does help me continue my work. So when you have two minutes of your time, go on to buzzsprout.com, find my podcast, Friends from Wild Places, and subscribe. It'll really help me. Um, Buzzsprout, let's create something great together. So yes, thank you, Kathy. Before we begin on some of the questions that I want to ask both of you, I want to find out a little bit about the events leading up to you joining African, I'm going to call it AOE, because it's quite a mouthful to keep on saying African Orphan Educational Foundation. <laughs> so please. Indeed go. it is. Indeed it is. You did such a good job. And yes, we do abbreviate it as AOE or AOEF because it is a mouthful. So thank you for doing such a good job and getting it right. Not everybody does. Yes, uh, I founded the organization about three and a half years ago. And that was after doing some mission work with a local mission here to Uganda. And I worked with them for about 10 years. They were primarily a medical mission and I had no medical training. But I was attending a church at that point, and God just kept pushing me and saying, just raise your hand and say, I'll go, nice. because it's biblical. So I did. And that was the beginning of what is now a 15-year journey into helping kids in Africa get an education, because 98 million of them don't. Wow. That's a very large number. Sure. So, Kathy... Have you always been in the nonprofit industry or, you know, did you start out working in a different business before this? I was so far from mission work. In fact, I never envisioned this for myself. I was in the television advertising and broadcasting field. I worked for a Fox station for 20 years as a sales manager. I worked for an ABC station, a CBS station, an NBC station, both in Florida and North Carolina, and uh, both West Palm Beach and Orlando. 
So I was used to hustle and bustle and making budgets and uh, bringing in the revenue. And it was great fun, met a lot of great people. And I started a faith journey at about age 40. And by 50, my feet were in Africa. Wow. What did you think of Africa, if I may ask? What was your well, my very, oh my goodness. All I can say to your listeners is if you've ever had the smallest hankering to just taste Africa, please go. Don't wait. Don't say someday. Put a date on it. Put a date on it and say 2023 or 2024 and go. You, you will never look back. Once Africa gets her hooks in you, you will... You know, it's a very, very special place. Let's just put it that way. It's so special. And everyone I know who's gone there has had an attachment to the continent and to the people. Nice. Oh, that makes my heart very happy to hear that. So what does African orphanage education do for the community? And what makes them different? Very, um, it's very simple. We, having realized that the children don't get to attend school, realized what the consequences of that are when they become teenagers and young adults. And without an education, their opportunities and their options just disappear. They don't have any options other than the same that maybe their parents and their grandparents have. And yet the talent in these kids, the visions in their heads are like any other kid. So we just want to see their dreams come alive, to be quite honest, and knew that for a very small nominal fee, we could help pay their tuition, their school supplies, their shoes, their uniforms, and that's from kindergarten all the way through college. So we have children who are just starting in P1 or P2, which is elementary school. We have high school students. We currently have, uh, we had four graduate from the Nile Vocational Institute in 2021. And we now have a young lady who is doing paramedic and EMT training in Kenya. So it's all, it runs the gamut. It's all over the board. Um, and we have, we do have partners on the ground who are our partners who we have vetted and worked with for quite a number of years, who are the ones who are identifying the children as the neediest in their community mm -hmm. and kind of lining them up for us as the ones who need help most now. So we are helping to underwrite, you know, identify sponsors who will carry their educational burden. And we do have many of these children and youth who have been in our program or our partners program all the way from kindergarten through college. Mm, that's awesome. And the reason why I ask is how are you different? And Matt, please chime in if you have any questions for Kathy, just, you know, butt in. I absolutely don't mind. But so just so you know, I sponsor a little guy um, in Africa called Vitor through compassion.com. And so every month I give something and they normally cover the food, the education, the, you know, whatever the kid needs, whether it be books, clothes, or, you know, whatever. But because if anyone, for the listeners, if anyone doesn't know, Compassion.com is quite a large company. Um, Matt, have you heard of them? I haven't, no. Right. They are massive and they're doing great work. But my concern was that, you know, the money that I'm giving every month, um, how do I know that it's getting to Vitor? You know, how, how do I know that the money is not being taken by the parents or the money is not getting stolen before it even reaches his hands? You know, so those are my concerns. And I mean, people might think it's so silly of me to be concerned. So I did email them and I asked all these questions and she responded and she was such a sweet lady. And then she was, she told me how everything worked and how they actually audit each and every church that is in contract with them. And they make sure that you know, the child gets the money through, you know, there was a couple of different things. I can't remember exactly what she said, but it really, it, it reinforced and helped me just find a little bit of peace um, about, you know, sponsoring. But 
you know, I like to hear the differences between the different nonprofits and what they supply. And you, you know, you did uh, just mention the fact that you focus more on education and you're not as big as Compassion.com. And I'm not, uh, I'm not trying to, to sound funny, but I think the bigger you get, the more you lose control. Whereas the smaller companies, they can still have, you know, their fingers in absolutely everything. Uh, mm. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm just saying. <laughs> no, that's, that's a really good thought. And I'm sure a lot of folks who give have that same question in their minds. Is it really going where it's supposed to, especially when you're dealing with international organizations? I must say that Compassion International is an amazing organization, but they are truly global. Do I believe that your funds are going where they're supposed to? I do, because I trust that organization implicitly, and I know of them, and they do an incredible job. And they have teams all over the ground, or on the ground, all over the world. So I think that you're doing a, a really good job there. Where we come in is we are much smaller. Yeah. We focus on education only, but I would like to add for those who know about Africa, they realize that some of the children also in the poorer families don't even get a chance to eat. So how do we meld the having enough nutrition to stay awake in school with being in school? And how we broach that is we only will support those schools who have a feeding program. And if they are very small schools, we will teach them how to start a feeding program so that all the children can eat and learn. So mm -hmm. if the school is not quite up to par, then we aren't supporting the children in that school yet, but we are teaching the school how to get there so that they can meet our standards. We literally go over to, our, to Kenya and Uganda uh, on a regular basis. We know all of the children. We know all of the staff members. We know the driver. We know the executive director. We know the mentors. We know each of the ch these children personally by name. And we do have our sponsors write notes to them. And we share pictures back and forth. And when we're there, we literally will bring the sponsor's handwritten note to the child and take a picture next to the child holding the note saying, here we are next to your child with your note. And that's how we're different. The other thing, Shireen, and thank you for asking that makes us a little different, is a lot of the larger international organizations do a great job getting, getting donors in, people who have a heart to help these kids because the need is vast. Mm -hmm. The need in Africa is vast. So they do a good job getting folks in. And generally speaking, very young child who's entering kindergarten or elementary school or primary school, as we call it there, will cost somewhere around $25, $35, $40 a month to cover everything they might need so they won't get kicked out of school. Now, bear in mind, you're not just paying for that student's needs. You're usually paying for 1 60th of the school's needs. So you don't just pay for their needs. The school to stay open usually will ask for three rolls of toilet paper per, per term and a broom and other things. So you are making sure that child does not get kicked out for any reason. So the only thing that happens on our end is a lot of people have a big heart and they support the children through primary school. And then guess what? Once they get into high school or secondary school or beyond, there's no one willing to pay double that amount to keep the children learning from primary school on. And it does almost double. So now you're talking 50, 60, $70 a month to get them all the way through the equivalent of high school and possibly skills training or college. So what we do is a little different. We don't say come in and help the young children. We say come in, support and follow a child. So it's a little bit different. And that's what keeps us smaller is mm -hmm. we don't want a large volume of children getting into primary school and not being able to get further. That's part of the issue. Wow. Wow. That's awesome. 
Thank you for sharing that, Kathy. If you could tell us one of the biggest challenges for you during this time with AOE, that would be awesome. I have asked Matt, so he did answer, but please go ahead and let me know your biggest challenge. It's probably the same challenge that most would answer, and ours was COVID. And I will, I, I will tell you why it was a little different for us. All we do is really put children in school. That is our foundation. That is our primary reason for being is covering educational needs. Mm -hmm. But when you realize we work in some of the poorest nations without electricity or running water or internet, when COVID hit, there was no remote learning. And Uganda was the nation that had schools closed for the longest two years. So how do you as an organization survive and bring in new funding and new sponsors when the schools are closed and there is no remote learning? That was a very challenging time for us. But I will tell you, it led to two incredible opportunities for us that we wasted no time getting right on top of. Well, if the schools aren't open, how do we become the curriculum? How do we start producing material that we can get over there as fast as possible? We weren't, we did not intend to develop what we developed, but in two short years, we published a children's story and coloring book called Mercy's Magnificent Dreams that was illustrated by artists in our community because we had no budget for it. Mm. It's now published, it's copyrighted, and it's in about five nations. And we also developed a 16-week leadership curriculum called From Leadership to Legacy that stimulated and engaged some of the older students who were high school and post-secondary school to keep them stimulated, engaged, learning, and challenged. And we are now working on the second iteration of that program and putting parts of it online so that instead of helping dozens and maybe hundreds, we can help thousands. So we're on a track to do things that we would not have done had COVID not put us in that really interesting spot where we said, now what? Right. Mm. Mm. We can oh. add, yeah, we can add that to, you know, the positive things that COVID brought. Um, it wasn't all bad. I'm sure a couple of us can can name a few things that, that COVID did that helped us, you know. Absolutely. There's a silver lining in every storm. <laughs> Right. And I mean, I mean, for me alone, it just stopped me because I needed to be stopped. And when I say stopped, I was working to the bone. So I, I was in the aviation industry, so I was flying and the money was never enough. So I wanted to fly more hours and that wasn't enough. And I flew more hours and I literally went to work, came back, worked out, went to sleep woke up, went to work, came back, went to sleep. And that was my life. And it was, what, almost 12 years of doing that. And then COVID kind of forced me to stop and go, okay, that's enough now. You need to reevaluate your life, Shireen. <laughs> and it made me just um, find what really was more important. And I'm so glad I did because I have a completely different look on life today. So, yeah, I appreciate your answer, Kathy. So to the both of you, I want to ask you a question. As business owners and entrepreneurs, what did, did that come naturally to you? Or it, was that something that you had to nurture? Uh, Matt, you go first. I think it did. It came natural, you know, in most of the jobs that I had before I started my own business, I always kind of ended up in some kind of manager, managerial position. So I'd say it came, it came pretty naturally. I always knew, you know, growing up that I, I didn't want to work for someone else. I always kind of had an entrepreneurial kind of mindset. So yeah, I'd say it came, came pretty natural. <laughs> I love that. I love that because yeah. that's different to a lot of the people that have come into my show. I think you are just a small handful that have actually been honest and said, no way. So it came naturally for me. I've always known that about myself. That's always what I would have done. And it's completely the opposite to me. So I love hearing um, 
about that. Um, and that's really cool. I take my hat off to you, Madge. I think that's really yeah. cool to be able to have that confidence. Is that it? Just that confidence to know, you know what? I'm made to do this. I'm good at doing this. And I really look up to that. And oh, that's really you. cool. Yeah. What about yourself, Kathy? Well, I can't, you know, in a certain way, I'll have to say it came naturally because when, even if you're working for corporate America, as we call it, I always had the sense that I wanted to be the best that was really driven into me as a child. So I wanted to be the best at everything I touched. And someone else, of course, got the benefit of that, which is fine because I always felt that I was very well compensated and I really, really enjoyed what I did or I probably wouldn't have been able to put in all the hours, like you're saying. Yeah. I lived it. I breathed it. I enjoyed it. And that's what I always have wanted to do in my life. So when the opportunity came to be able to switch gears, I didn't want to work for someone else. I wanted to try it on my own. I wanted to take my entrepreneurial bent and give it a go. Right. And because I knew of this need and also wanted to build a legacy, sure. I figured, you know what? If all other, if money weren't an, an object and there were no other limitations or boundaries on me, what would I want to do for the rest of my life? And as Shireen knows, there's also a cancer diagnosis in here somewhere. So mm -hmm. when cancer hits you square in the face and says, you may not be here, go live your life differently. What do you really want to do? My answer was, I want to take care of these children and children just like these for as long as I'm here. You. Thank so you. my entrepreneurial spirit was a little bit different. It was kind of forced on me in a certain way. It was it was a faith journey. It was a health diagnosis journey. And it was also a lot of things coming together at the same time where um, I, I really couldn't do any wrong. I knew how to run a program like this. I had training through the other mission society. And I just realized that now's my time. Let's go do this. Let's go do some good while we can. Well, thank you for sharing that. And I didn't know how much you wanted to share. So thank you. It means a lot. And it gets a personal touch to your story. I have asked Matt this already, but would, you know, I asked him what is, well, he kind of mentioned um, naturally on his own when he told me his story. But one of the questions that I think is important and people need to hear is, being a business owner and entrepreneur, you can get really, really busy and you can chase the empire that you're building and you kind of, um, like Matt was saying, lose what's important and you can start suffering with your health. And he was saying that one of the ways that he got back is he started doing the things that he loved again, which was cycling. What are the other, some of the other things that you mentioned, Matt? Exercise, got CrossFit, mountain biking, um, just getting outdoors with the family, camping again, okay. you know, fishing. Um, yeah, just getting outside and, and slowing everything down. <laughs> it's true. And it's true. And I ask people, what is it that you do to refill your tank? Because it is so important to refill that tank. And I know I've said, I mean, the listeners already know that I, I enjoy backpacking and getting outdoors. That's my way of breathing and taking time away from the business. Um, so Kathy would, you know, what you're doing now, what is your ways to refill your tank? I agree with what both of you said. I think being out in nature and breathing fresh air is the best way to refill your tank because it's meant to be that way. You know, the outdoors are meant to give us oxygen and to refill us and to renew us, not only physically with the breath and the air, but visually because it's life. There's life all around us and it's just teeming with all different colors and 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 action. It's 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 a beautiful way that we were set up to live in nature, with nature. But I will say for me, um, it's my faith because it restores me and also keeping an attitude of gratitude. And I think having done a lot of work in the villages where we have, it is, I can't not be grateful. Mm. I think of them every day. I know what they're going through. I have had quite a few moments of near paralysis, getting those phone calls or those WhatsApp messages 
um, that nearly paralyze you because I've never had to think about those things. No. So I think just an ad attitude of gratitude and realizing that I am blessed beyond measure that many of us are and that I have a privilege of being able to give back in some small way. I yeah, I, I was going to ask, I, I could imagine doing what you do. It's, it's probably can get quite emotional at times. I mean, just seeing what these people have are challenged with. I mean, I could only imagine it, it must be a really emotional kind of process as well, I, I would think. That's a really interesting perspective, Matt. And I will tell you that the beautiful part about getting your emotions up in what you do is it makes you fight even harder, is that you have to focus despite all the emotions. It's almost like being a first responder and right. putting aside what you see and knowing that there's an urgent situation that you and you alone need to tend to. And whether you know how to or not, it's yours. Right. Figure it out. So from, from being a business owner and an entrepreneur, you're put in situations you've never been in front of before and either you will respond or you won't. And there's great growth in that. The emotions, it took a few years just to try to put those aside and realize that these are just people who have some needs. And that's why we, you know, we do focus on education. We feel equipped to do that. I'm not equipped to do the medical, but we can certainly do education and make sure that there is a meal with that schooling. And we're doing quite a bit for these young people. Mm -hmm. So thank you. That was a really, a really thoughtful perspective on, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it can be tough. I'm sure. I'm yeah. sure. It's those kind of jobs where, where they are really tough on the heart, they can also be very rewarding. So yeah, thank you for what you do, Kathy. And on that, please tell us how we can help you. Oh, I'm sorry. There was a little bit of a freeze in the in the audio. Is was that question to me, Shireen? Yes, I was saying since we're on the topic, can you tell us how we can help you? Thank you so much for that question. Absolutely, the best way is to just visit our website and learn a little bit more about why we are and what we do and how we do it specifically and support is the best way. There are many ways for people to support us. Our website will be in the notes of the podcast, but it is www.africanorphaneducation.org. So we took the AL off of that. We took the foundation off. We shortened it a little. It's africanorphaneducation.org. Supporters can either support a, a student outright uh, at any level, or they can become a dream launcher. And our dream launchers are recurring monthly donors at any level. The most common level is $20 per month. And that helps us more than you would know. Some people say, oh, I know it's not much. No, you don't know, it is much. And it goes a long, long way. And the, the American dollar does go a long way in the villages where we work. And we stretch and we stretch and we stretch that dollar as far as we can. And we know exactly where every dollar is going. So that's the other beautiful part is we are on the ground. Our partners are on the ground. The African teams are on the ground and they've all worked together. We've all worked together for 10 years. So every single person has been vetted and they get report cards every month. That is awesome. I love so, that. So supporting us in any way, even just subscribing to our newsletter, it only comes out maybe six times a year because we put a lot of love and attention and pride into the newsletter. And it's can be a lot to keep up when you're when you're doing a lot of other things as well. But I would say subscribing to the newsletter and hearing the stories of some of our students and some of our volunteers and what's going on over there. We give them high fives when they graduate, when they get their first job. Um, and we also have a youth advisory council and a monthly call every month with 13 youth leaders from Africa that are doing amazing things. Right, that's awesome. After this podcast, I'm gonna have a look and see further on how I can help you because that what be you do is amazing work and um, your your stats that you gave us it's true we've got millions of children 
that need feeding, that are starving, that have had no education, no clothes, they sit at home because there's one parent and that one parent is working and they are left alone at home to fend for themselves. And so a lot of them having nothing, no education, no nothing. So I really, really, really have a heart for what you do and I appreciate it. So I'm definitely going to have a look on how. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thank you so much. All right, so we have come to the part of the podcast where we're going to play a little bit of a game. It's called Would You Rather? Um, Have you played Would You Rather, Matt? I don't think I have not, no. (laughs) Kathy's already shaking her head. No, but I I think I'm ready. Okay, (laughs) so Would You Rather is a little bit of a fun game because we can discuss a little bit of why you say what you say. So pick one. Would you rather go without TV or junk food for the rest of your life? Kathy? I would rather go without junk food for the rest of my life. Really? (laughs) Matt? I'd have to say the same because I don't eat much. So junk food, that is. Right. See, I don't really watch much TV, so I can go without TV for the rest of my life and be perfectly fine. But <laughs> I... well, and of course, I I worked in the television industry, so I would never give up my television. And Matt <laughs> mentioned that he's trying to be more outdoorsy and active, and so am I. So that's why I would give up the junk food. Okay. All right. Well, I must be honest. I do like um, a couple of nights where I can go out and get some real good but hey I've got to be honest in America you guys have amazing takeouts that's junk food you call it junk food I call it takeaways but you do you have the most amazing takeaways Wendy's is one of them (laughs) 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 that is another Yeah, it tastes good while you're eating it, and then 20 minutes later, you're just like yeah, regretting your decisions. But yeah, well, I've got to take my head off to you guys. You do <laughs> really know how to do takeaways. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's do another one. Let's do another one. Okay. okay, would you rather spend the day at an amusement park or lazing on the beach, Matt? Uh, I have to say probably the amusement park. Mm. Kathy? Well, because I've lived in Florida for most of my life and spent my life on the beach, I'm going to say an amusement park. (laughs) I'm with you. I'm with you because I'm the same. I've been living on the coast uh, all my life and um, I know what it's like to be a little bit of a beach baby off to school every day. So uh, as I grow older... I don't mind a day at the beach every now and again, but I would quite rather run around a amusement park, especially Harry Potter World, and enjoy oh. <laughs> and enjoy my time there with family and friends. So yes, I'm a little bit of a, a Harry Potter fan. So awesome. That's great. That's great. <laughs> okay, would you rather be fluent in all languages or be a master of every musical instrument Mm. okay this is a tough one i know oh my goodness fluent in every language or a master of every instrument is that the question yes wow this is a big toss-up i love language and i love music so you're killing me here shireen Mm -hmm. I would love to be able to create my own symphony at the snap of a finger, but I love language more because you can communicate with people and you can share ideas. And even though music also is communicative and I'm an artist and I love visual art, I love musical art. Yeah, this is a big toss up, but I think I would rather show someone respect by knowing their culture and be able to speak their language. Right, right. I'm with you. Matt, what about you? I'd take the language. Mm-hmm. It's been uh, on my list uh, to learn two languages in the next five years. So 
Nice. I've got my, uh, what's the app that I got? The uh, the language teaching one. I can't think of the name now, but. There's an app. There's a few of them. About that. Yeah. Um, but I, I take the language. Yeah. yeah. I, I agree with you. It's a hard one. I'm in the same boat as Kathy. I'm torn uh, because I do, I do love musical instruments. I mean, I started playing piano when I was quite young. But if I have to absolutely pick, it'll definitely, without a doubt, be fluent in all languages. I'm not saying it's going to break every language barrier because even people that all speak English in one room can have horrible miscommunications because nowadays one sentence in English can mean multiple different things, which is quite frustrating, but true. So, but I would still like to learn multiple different languages so that I can talk to different people on my journeys and travels wherever I go mm -hmm. to. Okay, do we have time for one more? Yes, okay. Would you rather sing a song in front of complete strangers or your closest friends? Hmm. Matt. I'd take friends. Um, you know my struggles with public speaking, so getting up in front of a bunch of strangers and having to sing a song would be terrifying. So I'd, I'd take the friends. Mm. Yeah, Kathy? Plus they, they'd still love me after they heard how terrible I was. So. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> I would say friends also, Matt and Shireen, mostly because I really can't hold a tune. I love music. <laughs> I love to harmonize. And I'm not afraid of getting up in front of people. I love getting up in front of people and sharing any kind of story. I'm, I'm definitely, I think having been in sales for so many years, I'm a people person, but uh, if it's something I'm not good at, I would <laughs> rather share it with friends because they will love me no matter what. Right. That, that's Even true. if it sounds horrible. <laughs> that's true. I'm a little difficult. I absolutely struggle to speak in front of people in general. But I am a little bit more comfortable around my friends, but they are the same people that will probably rip me apart because I cannot sing. <laughs> so they will probably be brutally honest, which is fine. But yes, at the end of the day, they are my friends and, you know, they don't care. But yeah. So if I have to pick, it'll probably be friends as well. But then again, you know, when you're in front of strangers, you never have to see them again, so you can run away. And <laughs> well, that is so true. When you think about all the cab drivers in the world and all the hairdressers in the world that know everybody's secrets and hear them sing, and you don't have to worry about it. You're right. Right, right. But I think everyone's got a different perspective on that one because I think, uh, yeah, you have to actually have the courage to step up, and I'm not very good with that. So. Yeah, so thank you so much. It is that time when we're going to end the podcast, but I do want to first spend some time thanking both of you for being a part of the podcast. And also, as listeners, people make connections, and I know there might be some people that might have a connection with you and would like to have a little bit of a more one to one kind of a conversation. And if you're willing to do that, where can people find you? So, Kathy. Well, I have connections all over the world now and all over Africa. So I would say to reach out to me via email first is always recommended, which is Kathy, my first name, which is K-A-T-H-I-E at AfricanOrphanEducation.org. Just Tell them, you know, send me a quick email and say, I heard you on Shreen's podcast and I would like to learn more or I would like to get involved and I will open the door wide. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Matt, what about you? Yeah, if they wanted to reach out, they could reach me through our website, which is avalawadlingtoncontractors.com or by email, which is matt at 
apple at wadlington.com um yeah love it thank you guys and it, where to find me quite easy you've heard me say it before you can find friends from long places youtube channel on youtube where you can go and subscribe subscribe like comment do whatever you you wish there but you can also find me on linkedin shireen borta as well as twitter friends from long places and please go ahead and subscribe at friendsfromwildplaces.buzzsprout.com. That's friendsfromwildplaces.buzzsprout.com. And do all the things, share the podcast with friends and family. And if you are an Apple fan, then you can find me on iTunes and do me a favor, leave a review, tell me your honest opinion. I am ready for it. So I'm saying that, guys. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time. And remember, you got this, and stay wild. Bye, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. You've been listening to Friends from Wild Places with Shireen Buerta. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast from the links to catch every episode and unleash your passion.